At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Timothy Yap to come on and do his portion of the presentation. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Yap. Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, really want to thank um, the FOSS community really for giving me this opportunity and at least for the very kind of invitation to speak about a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, you know, something that I've been working on now for about coming 18 years. Uh, very fortunate to be part of the original team that found the clinical evidence that PARP inhibitors actually work in patients with germline BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations, and also, you know, in the subsequent years, other alterations as well. So it's a real privilege to be here, uh, and uh, I look forward to discussing uh, these uh, very key questions uh, that, to be honest, we face on a day-to-day -day basis for all of our patients. Uh, we know that PARP inhibitors are now approved, but the key question is what happens after a PARP inhibitor? These are my disclosures. So plenty to discuss, and uh, I've done a brief overview here, but I'm not going to go through this, but it'll become very apparent as we uh, go through the slides. So all of you know that uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations can be inherited. A uh, very famous person who came out and told his story, of course, was Angelina Jolie, um, whose mother and aunt as well also had the BRCA1 uh, faulty gene, if you like, and they had breast and ovarian cancer. And because of this high risk, she did undergo uh, preventative surgery uh, to remove her breasts and ovaries to really reduce her chances of uh, developing subsequent cancer. So what is BRCA? Well, BRCA is a gene that we all have, and that helps to repair DNA damage that we may incur on a day-to-day -day basis. However, having a mutation or an abnormality in the BRCA gene really impairs the repair of DNA damage. And of course, this then leads to one abnormal cell, to two, to four, to eight, and eventually a ball of abnormal cells, i.e. cancer. And this risk is not just seen in women. Uh, of course, it impacts men as well. We know about prostate cancer that men are at increased risk of, and also male breast cancer as well. And of course, men and women can develop pancreatic cancer and women ovarian cancer and breast cancer as well. So I thought it'd be good to just talk about and to show in a pictorial form why we think PARP inhibitors work or how they actually work or the whole rationale behind it without getting too technical. So I want everyone online listening in and thanks for calling in to think about yourselves as a table with four different legs and each leg representing a DNA repair pathway such as the BRCA pathway or the PARP pathway. That's also known as the base excision repair pathway. And what I show here is a table representing the normal cells in a BRCA carrier, right? So they don't have cancer, but basically, if you give a PARP inhibitor to such individuals, you basically remove the PARP pathway or one leg. And guess what? The table still stands because it has three legs and BRCA is functioning. This is in contrast to a cancer cell in a BRCA carrier. So in such cancers, the BRCA is not functioning. And so at baseline, before you give anything, the BRCA leg is already missing, as you can see from that pictorial there on the, on the bottom left. So what happens when you give patients a PARP inhibitor? Well, you remove that third leg and guess what? The table collapses. And it's really this difference between the top normal cells and the bottom tumor cells in the BRCA carrier that we really felt going into the clinic that a targeted approach by inhibiting PARP in BRCA mutated cancers will lead to well-tolerated and effective therapy. And this is really what we call uh, synthetic lethality. It's a concept, but now proven with the approval of PARP inhibitors in BRCA mutated patients. And we now have four approved PARP inhibitors 
uh, that you'll be very familiar with, Olaparib, also known as Limpaza, Rucaparib, Niraparib, and Talazoparib. And they're all approved in different indications, in different settings, in different cancer types. I'm not going to go through these. But these really uh, provided proof of concept for this synthetic lethal strategy in oncology. And now we're trying to go beyond PARP inhibitors. And the good news is that the whole therapeutic landscape, what we call the DNA damage response uh, therapeutic landscape, DNA damage response or DDR is kind of the umbrella term for these types of drugs like PARP inhibitors and the ones that I'm going to mention in about five seconds. The good news is that this therapeutic landscape and DDR is rapidly expanding beyond PARP inhibitors and it really allows us to identify patients who will benefit because of their genetic abnormalities regardless of their cancer type. So beyond PARP inhibitors, we have ATR, V1, ATM, DNEPK, CHECK1, PARP1, selective drugs that I'll mention later, Polfeta inhibitors, PKMIT1, USP1, and PAG inhibitors, which are the latest under the clinic. And the good news is that we also have other agents and classes of drugs that are making their way into the clinic as well. I show here an example of a uh, a 66-year-old male with melanoma who unusually had a BRCA2 mutation, and this patient actually went on to get an ATR inhibitor, had 100% decrease in his tumor size that lasted approximately 17 months. And this was a patient who was very heavily pretreated. He, <coughs> excuse me. He had a PARP inhibitor, which he did not respond to, also had immunotherapy as well, but then went on to an ATR inhibitor, uh, which really worked very well for him, as you can tell from these images. So these are the things that I'm going to be touching on. And it's important for us to develop drugs beyond PARP inhibitors because we know that the first generation approved PARP inhibitors are associated with and are limited by side effects. Right? We typically see three classes of side effects. Number one, myelosuppression, so drops in the red cells, the white cells, and the platelets. We also see a little bit of fatigue and also GI symptoms as well. And importantly, not all patients with these BRCA mutations will respond. And even if they do, drug resistance is unfortunately nearly inevitable as well. And so for me as a physician, I, I really do think there's great potential. And to be honest, responsibility on us to deepen the responses and to also increase the durability of these responses for patients who receive PARP inhibitors and to go beyond that. And I also do think that it's, there's great potential to widen the application of PARP inhibitors and other DDR inhibitors that I've already mentioned. So as, as the topic uh, suggests, we're really navigating a post-PARP inhibitor world right now in research. We know that PARP inhibitor resistance, unfortunately, is complex, it's multifactorial, and therefore we really need to better understand the underlying mechanisms. And any treatment strategies to really overcome this drug resistance will ultimately depend on the underlying mechanisms. And therefore we need new targets to go beyond PARP, to get new drugs and to develop new drugs. We need new predictive biomarkers beyond BRCA1 and BRCA2 to really go after. And ultimately, I think we need rational combination strategies. So how do we best think about resistance mechanisms since it's so complex? And I, I can tell you, it's not just for patients, but also for investigators and physicians alike. So a simplistic way to think about PARP and the resistance is in three different buckets. So I, the first bucket is one that you may have thought of uh, before or heard of, and that's something called BRCA reversion. And that's when the tumor actually has a second mutation that reverses the resistance, uh, but that reverses, sorry, the actual mutation. So it's what we call a reversion from the mutation to a wild type uh, mutation, i.e. the tumor that actually lost its function actually regains the BRCA function or whatever the uh, mutation was. So it may regain the BRCA function and so its repair function, or it may re regain its RAD51 function as well if the patient had a RAD51 mutation in their tumor. 
So that's the first bucket out of three. The second bucket is something called replication stress, which we th we believe now is very important as we think about how to target cancers that have PARP and IPSO resistance, because we do believe that replication stress goes up through uh, with resistance and actually drives resistance in cancers. And we do have new treatments such as ATR and we one and IPSO that actually target replication stress. And then a third bucket's kind of my get out clause. So this is kind of resistance mechanisms through every other mechanism. And these include uh, pharmacokinetics, so how much drug levels we have. There are newer alterations like Schlafen 11, uh, loss of EMT, so on and so forth. But this is kind of the third bucket, which is everything else. And <clears throat> these individually probably comprise small percentages of each of, of patients. So a, a key question for me is, are we actually picking up these resistance mechanisms in the clinic, or how do we actually detect them? And the good news is that we are indeed picking up resistance mutations, such as the re reversion alterations. You can see here in the ARIEL-2 trial, which is a trial uh, test, testing the PARP and episode Rucaparib, that they were able to pick up these reversion alterations. And there was a good correlation that those that they picked that up in were the patients who either had progressive disease or were survival. They were also able to pick up something called uh, BRCA1 methylation loss as well. And again, this is a resistance mechanism in patients. So we can pick up some of these alterations. And as mentioned, you know, we now have various agents that we can use in patients who stop responding to PARP inhibitors. But there are several challenges as listed here. As mentioned, it's multifactorial. There is no clear dominant mechanism, and that's very important. <coughs> I've mentioned BRCA reversions. <coughs> However, we're still trying to define how best <coughs> to detect um, such alterations in patients. Can we do it in circulating tumor DNA? Or do we need tumor biopsies? And if so, when should we do this, right? If it's an ovarian cancer patient, should we do it when the tumor markers are going up or should we do it at progression? And even if we find these alterations, what's the best strategy to really try and overcome such resistance? How about the other resistance mechanisms? What are the strategies to detect and to also treat these mechanisms of resistance. And these are things that we're currently working on. The fourth question is really, do we need to continue PARP inhibitors? Because we do see that when you combine a PARP inhibitor with a second drug, we do see added toxicities and side effects. And so uh, very often we have to reduce the dose of the partner drug or both drugs or increase the schedule. And so do we need to continue PARP inhibitors? That's something we're trying to answer as well. PARP and IPSA combinations, there's certainly many of them right now out there. As mentioned, we do see some added toxicities, and so we need to really think outside the box in terms of how best to combine drugs. Should we give them sequentially, one drug after another, rather than concomitantly? How about using lower doses, but intermittently of both drugs? And then a key question really is, should we try and reverse resistance, or should we try and prevent resistance by using a maintenance strategy that's been very successful, for example, uh, in ovarian cancer. So these are some of the trials that we're running in our department, uh, PARP inhibitors as monotherapy and also in combination, ATR inhibitors as monotherapy and also in combination, and many new drugs that are coming through as well. Too many to go through right now, but I just wanted to, I guess, show you the types of drugs that we're working on uh, right now. <clears throat> I, I did want to touch on a, a new type of PARP inhibitor. This is a PARP1 selective drug. So we know that the first generation of PARP inhibitors block both PARP1 and PARP2, but preclinically at least, we know that PARP2 is essential for retropoiesis, so red cell generation and generation of other key cells. And therefore, that if you block PARP2, that brings with it toxicities and side effects, such as myelosuppression, like anemia. Um, and therefore, AstraZeneca were really the first in a clinic 
to actually create these very selective POP1 specific drugs. And our hope here is that this, these drugs will be much better tolerated. It means that we can also give a much higher dose in patients and achieve you know, what we call target inhibition, meaning we can actually block POP a lot, strong, uh, a lot stronger than the actual original first generation drugs. And we certainly hope that this will translate to greater anti-tumor activity and efficacy and also allow the combination with other drugs. And so here are the preclinical data. I won't go through this in great detail, but here are some clinical data. I just wanted to share three pieces of uh, data that we've presented before. You can see here that uh, at in, in the orange box, I show here increasing doses of the PARP1 selective inhibitor called AZD5305. And in the gray box, you have you actually have the drug exposures with the original uh, PARP1 and 2 first-generation PARP inhibitors that are already approved. And what you can see here with that is that with increasing doses of AZD5305, this actually achieves much higher fall coverage over what we call the target effective concentration. So you can basically get much higher doses of drug into patients, uh, hopefully without the side effects. And what we're seeing here on the next slide are that when you put the 5305 drug on the right-hand side, as you can see there in the right column, versus all of the approved agents at the full dose. You can see here, if I draw your attention to the bottom two rows, that only 3% of patients required dose reductions due to any treatment emergent side, side effect. Only 2% of patients required discontinuations uh, due to any side effect, as you can see there. And it, in general, it was much better tolerated, meaning that you're getting much better bang for your buck, if you like. We can, we're able to get much higher doses of a PARP1 uh, selective drug into patients versus the first generation PARP inhibitors. So does this translate to efficacy? Well, this is a wonderful plot. So each of these bars represents an individual patient. Any bar going below the line indicates shrinkage of cancers, and any bar going below this dotted line, minus 30%, are patients who actually had a resist response or an objective response. And you can see clearly in each of these colors here in this slide, in this waterfall plot, uh, represents the different doses. And we actually saw responses from the first dose level onwards. So we saw responses across doses. You can see here we also saw responses across different cancer types, not just ovarian, but also breast, prostate, and pancreatic cancer. We also saw responses in patients with ovarian cancer who were platinum chemotherapy, refractory, or resistant. We also saw responses across different mutations, including not just your BRCA1 and 2, but also PALB2 mutations and relative 51C mutations. Uh, and here's an example of uh, the patient with a germline relative 51C mutation who had a hormone receptor positive breast cancer, heavily pretreated six prior lines of therapy. Patient came on to trial, you can see the scans here on the right hand side. Compared with baseline, you can see that the patient had a reduction in a plural effusion. You can see that grayness there going away. The patient had shrinkage of liver lesions, shown here, and also of a lung lesion. You can see a very nice uh, tumor marker reduction as well on treatment. So, certainly, this drug looks very promising and it's currently. Uh, in the late phase of the phase one trial testing, it's already entered phase two trials in combination with different drugs. So how about other drugs that I mentioned earlier, such as the ATR inhibitor? So what is ATR? Well, it's a critical component, again, of the DNA damage response pathway, and it's activated by that term that I mentioned earlier, replication stress, or it, it's also activated by any DNA damage. And it really has a key role in the recovery of cells from this replication stress and DNA damage by facilitating um, you know, the, rep the recovery from what we call stalled replication FOX, and it prevents premature mitosis of cells. So coming in with an ATR inhibitor really is attractive because we can target cancers with high replication stress and those with DDR mutations. 
and there are now multiple ATR indexes out there. I've listed uh, some of them here, but we certainly have at least eight different ATR indexes that are currently in the clinic. I'm going to show you some data from some of the trials that we've been involved with. For example, the ATR indexes are now uh, from Repair, now belonging to Roche, uh, who acquired it from Repair. Um, these are some data that we had presented here. You can see that we saw responses and patients who had received PARP analysis in the past with ovarian cancer, who had specific mutations such as the BRCA1 mutation or RAP51C mutation. We also saw responses in BRCA mutated ER positive breast cancer, head and neck cancers, melanoma, and also prostate cancer as well. Here's an example of one of those patients with germline BRCA1 mutation ovarian cancer. The patient did progress on a PARP episode before this, had multiple lines of treatment, as you can see listed at the bottom, including platinum chemotherapy. And you can see here that the patient had a response, um, uh, shrinkage of the cancer, and also shrink, uh, lowering of the CA125 um, tumor marker. And, um, you know, ultimately, we also felt that we could go beyond BRCA mutations. And we knew that there was also a synthetic lethal relationship between ATR inhibitors and patients who had ATM loss of function or ATM mutations or loss of the ATM protein. And you can see here a spider plot. Each of these lines represents a single patient. Anything below the line is good. That shows shrinkage of the cancers. You can see here in this trial that we conducted some time back that the responses were seen across different cancers. The responses were pretty deep, greater than 50%. These patients had ATM mutations, or there was also a BRCA1 mutation patient as well, and they were very durable. Patients would actually receive this drug for more than a year because of ongoing response. So again, another promising um, drug that we have currently in clinical trials. And importantly, the key question is, can these drugs actually overcome resistance? And BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutated cancers. And certainly, preclinical data suggested that yes, these ATR inhibitors can work in a PARP inhibitor resistance testing, including those with BRCA mutations. And so we put that to the test. Uh, and uh, we actually then combined uh, PARP inhibitors with ATR inhibitors. And the whole rationale here is that we know that PARP inhibitors essentially cause what we call DNA adducts, so DNA damage. And this causes a stalled replication FOX or increased replication stress. And as I mentioned earlier, the ATR protein is in charge of actually the recovery of these cells from replication stress. So we felt that by blocking ATR, we can actually stop these cancers from repairing itself, from recovering from replication stress. And together with some form of DDR mutation, like a BRCA mutation, the combination of an ATR inhibitor plus a PARP inhibitor will actually lead to an increased DNA damage and hopefully death of the cancer or shrinkage of the cancer in the clinic. And multiple combination trials are now ongoing. This was the original trial that we ran together with AstraZeneca of their ATR inhibitor plus Olaparib or Limpasa. You can see that there were uh, several challenges to combine these drugs because we were seeing overlapping side effects like myelosuppression, so lone red cells, white cells, and platelets. And in the end, we were able to get a, a dose of drug. This was a full dose of Olaparib together with one week's worth of uh, the ATR inhibitor. And so is this ATR inhibition good enough for synergy between the two drugs? Well, we were able to see responses, as you can see here. And also, there have been further trials that have been done. Uh, and so uh, you can see here, again, the side effects that we observed, mainly anemia, so low red cells, low platelets, and low white cells as well. And so we really need to think about how we can best combine these drugs, which have very similar side effect profiles. And so we've been testing high doses of ATR inhibitors with low doses of PARP inhibitors in patients who've already had a PARP inhibitor since, you know, they probably do not need the full dose of a PARP inhibitor in that setting. We've also been assessing intermittent doses of both drugs uh, to allow normal tissue recovery by giving patients drug holidays. 
we've also been testing the sequential use of these drugs and so not giving them together concurrently, but to give them one after another. Uh, so we've tested as well uh, other combinations as well with PARP inhibitors, such as a we one inhibitor combination. We've seen quite a bit of side effects. We know that it works. We've seen that it works in patients, but we've seen that it, by giving the drugs together, it may lead to side effects as listed here. So mainly GI side effects like diarrhea, low red cells, low platelets, and also some fatigue. And so what we've been doing is to use different ways to schedule the drugs, uh, including a sequential use of both drugs. So a key question I get asked is what I do with all of these drugs that we have here. How do we think about which drug gets which treatment uh, when we see them. So when, when I do see a patient with an HRR mutation, so a DDR mutation like a BRCA1 or BRCA2 or RED51C mutation or, or RED1D or PALB2 mutation, if they're not a clinical trial candidate, I would either offer them uh, or speak to their referring physician to get them uh, a PARP inhibitor uh, off-label if needed, or a platinum-based chemotherapy, because platinum chemotherapy works uh, through very similar mechanisms as PARP inhibitors as well, and they, they might actually be effective drugs for these patients as well. Uh, if they are a trial candidate, and if they have a BRCA1 or 2 or rad 51 COD or PALB2 mutation, uh, I would offer them a PARP1 selective PARP inhibitor. If they have other mutations as well, because don't forget, when you do sequencing of your cancer, such as through foundation medicine, or for example, at MD Anderson, we have our own panel of 600 odd genes. If there are other mutations, and we have a combination that can target not just the BRAC mutation, but also other alterations, and we have that combination, I would actually offer them that particular uh, combination as well. If they have an ATM mutation, just given the promise that we've seen with ATR and epitaxis, uh, I would offer them an ATR inhibitor. Now, if they've already had a PARP inhibitor and they have uh, one of these DDR mutations, we have many different agents that are currently being tested either by themselves or in combination with PARP inhibitors, such as Polfeta inhibitors, USP1, and PARG inhibitors as well. We also have different PARP inhibitor combinations, for example, with V1 inhibitors and also BAT inhibitors as well. And if patients have something called CCNE1 amplification, so they have too much of this uh, gene or protein called CCNE1, also known as cyclin E, we would offer them either something called a PKMET1 inhibitor or a CDK2 inhibitor or V1 inhibitor. Or we would offer them, say, a PARP inhibitor combination with one of these drugs. There are many different alterations, and so it can get confusing. Uh, I would certainly discuss things with your physician and oncologist with regards to which they feel is the best fit uh, for a particular cancer. So uh, that's my talk in a nutshell, and here are my take-on points, and uh, we really need to build on the success that we have seen with PARP inhibitors as monotherapy, and therefore we're trying to move beyond PARP inhibitors, and when we are seeing some promising results, with ATR inhibitors, with V1 inhibitors, and other newer DDR drugs. And we're also combining many of these drugs uh, with PARP inhibitors and other agents such as the ATR inhibitors. And with that, I just want to acknowledge, of course, uh, you know, again, FOSS for all of the support that they, they've provided us, all of our patients and our caregivers, my colleagues at MD Anderson, many DDR PARP inhibitor collaborators, my research team, and of course, a lot of grants that we've applied for to support our work in DDR, and of course, industry partners as well. Uh, and with that, I'll hand things back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yap. We had a, a number of questions come through. We'll save those for the Q&A portion of the talk. Um, but thank you again for your presentation that you just read through with us. Very informative and a lot of information there for our constituents. So next up, of course, we have Dr. Kathy Dumbrava. I'm going to hand it over to you to run the next portion of the presentation. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It's such an honor to be here. So today we will talk more about immunotherapy. 
And um, before getting into what is uh, next beyond immunotherapy, let's just take a moment and discuss what is immunotherapy. And so the immune system, what is its role? And so imagine that cancer cells occur in every one of us. However, our immune system is able to recognize the cancer cell and kill it. And not everyone develops uh, cancer. Now, the immune system has two important parts. One that we call the innate part, which, uh, has, uh, which uh, has the part that it's not really specialized but it responds immediately to, uh, to an, an injury or an infection. And so these are some of the chemical barriers such as saliva, and so also some of the cellular uh, defenses such as neutrophils and other types of white blood cells. And or the second part, uh, which is uh, the acquired part, uh, that uh, it, uh, it is, um, what we call also adaptive, that, that is more specialized. And we talk about uh, the T cells and the B cells, which are part of uh, um, the white blood cells. And so um, a part of, um, of the B cells, which again, they are uh, lymphocytes and they are part of the immune system, they, uh, they are more specialized and also the B cells, um, they have uh, the antibodies that you hear about that they have on, on their surface. And uh, the antibody, uh, it is very specific to one antigen that he can recognize and also are, um, uh, are useless for other antigens. And so, for example, when we come in contact with the common cold, uh, the B cells that have antibodies on their surface, um, as that they are specific for the common cold, uh, so multiplies very fast and they become essential for the immune response to fight the infection. And so the B cells perform two very important functions. So one is that they can differentiate into plasma cells that will produce and release the antibodies. And the second is that they can become memory B cells and they can also present, uh, we are calling them antigen presenting cells. So they can uh, become some uh, uh, cells that help uh, uh, to the immune system to recognize the, the cancer cell. And so let's just one more uh, minute to talk about antibodies. You're hearing so much about monoclonal antibodies. And then, so I mentioned that the B cells, that they are producing the antibodies. And so these are also known as immunoglobulins. And these terms are very uh, synonymous, like in between when you hear antibodies or immunoglobulins. And there are these Y-shaped complex molecules that they have two heavy chains and two light chains. And at the bottom of the Y, uh, you can see the, the, or the FC portion that um, binds to the cells of the immune cells. And the top of uh, the Y, you can see uh, there in, the, in the, the square that uh, it's called the variable region and that can take millions of possible configurations and it matches one single antigen. So what you, you see here that you can, you can see that it, it's really specific. And so when you're hearing about um, often about monoclonal antibodies, so what does monoclonal antibody mean? Is that they are antibodies that they are identical and they are produced by the same type of immune cells and the cl are clones from a single parent cell that multiplies and produces the same type of antibodies. And there, are, there exist also poly polyclonal antibodies, but for the anti-cancer treatment and what we will focus on today is we are talking about monoclonal antibodies. So that being said, this was a long introduction, but really uh, understanding how these work, what is an antibody, what does it do, 
it's so important to know what what is next as uh, probably uh, as you heard the uh, dr yap about so many advances beyond proper for immunotherapy we are still trying to understand better the how the immune system works so we can uh, we can better find the new types of immunotherapies new types of combinations and so one uh, like how the antibodies work is that they can attach to the receptor or the some of the proteins on the surface of the cancer cell also it can um, it can cause like uh, when uh, it can kind of tag the in uh, the cancer cell like with uh, a signal such as eat me uh, then uh, there are some other white blood cells that are called macrophages. They will be able to recognize the cancer cell and kill it. There is another type of what we call antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity or ADCC. And so this is another mechanism of antibodies when these attach to some of the path pathogens or abnormal abnormal cancer cells and they recognize uh, the, um, they help the immune cells so uh, to recognize the, the cancer cell and so it can directly uh, the immune cells can directly uh, kill it and so the ones that you see in red they are really the ones that we use in cancer and so but when are all monoclonal antibodies immunotherapies? I had this question um, asked by one of my patients, and uh, they are like, "Is they are have we hear, hear about antibodies? All or antibodies immunotherapy?" And so the answer is yes, but no. So we make a different, we differentiate what we call targeted therapies, like the target that the antibody is really focusing on is on the cancer cell, we call it more mostly a, a targeted therapy. And one example is like the Herceptin for patients with breast cancer or gastric cancer that is targeting a protein that is called HER2. Now for when the target is on the immune cells, so we are targeting the immune cells to to respond and to recognize the cancer cells, uh, so, uh, such as the immune checkpoint inhibitors, then we talk more about immunotherapy. And so, uh, the, so a monoclonal antibody can be called a target therapy in some cases or an immunotherapy. Now, what is an immune checkpoint inhibitor? And you hear about so much about immunotherapy. And so immune checkpoint inhibitor and checkpoints are some normal parts of the immune system. Their role is to prevent an immune response from being so strong that it can destroy healthy cells in the body. And so immune checkpoints engage when proteins on the surface of the, the cell, immune cells that they are called the, the T cells recognize and bind to a partner protein on the other cells, uh, such as the tumor cells. And these proteins are called immune checkpoint proteins or into a checkpoint um, in immune checkpoints. And the drugs that we are giving that they are immune checkpoint inhibitors that we are trying to, to block this, uh, these proteins from binding to each other and so it, it really prevents the off signal from being sent and it allows the T cells to activate and kill the cancer cell. And so such drug um, acts against um, a checkpoint inhibitor like a PD-1 or PDL one These are the most known ones and they keep the immune responses like in check in this way the, the immune cell you can see here that it is more it's activated and it can recognize and kill the tumor cell and they are uh, these type of treatments the, the immune checkpoint inhibitors are approved in many tumor types here you can see a list of them that they are approved either either as single agent or in combination with chemotherapies. 
there is uh, just one exception, and we will talk about that. It is a newer approval of two com two drugs that they are combined and both are immunotherapies. And in addition to the long list of tumor types, you see here that the last in this list is that it's any solid tumor that is not able to repair errors in its DNA uh, or um, when, uh, when the DNA is copied. So what, what does that mean? And so I wanted to, to spend just two minutes to talk about uh, uh, DNA, uh, uh, DNA repair deficiency or microsite satellite the instability. And uh, you heard, um, you know, Dr. Yap talk about uh, DNA damage repair. So this is, um, it's uh, still in very, in that category, but it's a little bit different from uh, the BRCA mutations. And uh, the germline um, uh, equivalent of this, if uh, there is an error that is happening in one of uh, the hereditary mutations, it is called the Lynch syndrome. But what is really a DNA mismatch repair deficiency? So when um, a cancer cell or normal cell divides, it must make a copy of the DNA. And so let's, uh, the, each of the, the daughter cells will have a full set of genes, but mistakes happen, you know, when you're copying, you know, just imagine that you are making a copy of the copy of the copy, like at one point, you cannot read very well the copy and there are errors that happen. And so the, there are some ways to, uh, to fix these errors. However, um, if there are those, um, those ways that we, we use, which are, are called DNA mismatch repair, does not work. We call it DNA uh, mismatch repair deficient. And so it means that actually the, the, the cell cannot fix its mix mistakes and can become cancer. Now, I had another question from a patient asking me, what's the difference between microsatellite instability or MSI high and a mismatch repair deficiency? And they are used very often uh, describing the same thing. Uh, micro, microsatellites are short, uh, repeated pieces of DNA, and the number of the macro, macro, microsatellites in a cell can uh, become unstable when a cell cannot fix its mistakes, and this instability can cause uh, cancer uh, as well. And so, in uh, um, I mentioned that uh, about Lynch syndrome, so this is a hereditary um, uh, defect in one of these uh, five uh, mutations, and in uh, mutation in one of these five genes. And uh, these um, genetic mutations are passed from uh, parents to, uh, to, to the children during the, the fetal development. And uh, some, however, some of these genetic mutations can occur randomly without being present in someone's family history. But, um, and so you see that there is such a, an increased risk of, uh, of developing more cancer. And also when um, uh, these alterations can happen, not just as hereditary, but also in, uh, in different cancers. And I know that uh, uh, this group is really more focused on gynecological malignancies and breast cancer. And as you can see, like in ovarian cancer or endometrial, like 10, uh, up to 30% of endometrial cancer will have MSI high. And so why, why this is important and why I'm telling you about these is because the, these patients, in addition to patients with or high tumor mutation burden, they have a higher uh, chance of uh, for immunotherapy to work. And why is that? And so well, usually when we, I say, well, uh, you have more mutations, right? Usually mutations are perceived as something bad. And so, uh, however, tumors with MSI high 
for high tumor mutation, they will, uh, will be able to respond better to immunotherapy because it will, be, they, it will be easier for the immune cells to recognize the cancer cell and uh, to identify it as something bad and it's not uh, take it as, as one of the, the normal cells and really be able to, uh, to kill it and uh, in this way patients to respond to these treatments. And we had, uh, we had an approval of uh, the pembrolizumab of, um, uh, for patients who have, uh, for any solid tumors, who have MSI high and uh, or uh, MMR deficient. And so when we also have for high tumor mutation burden for, for another, uh, 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 that it is, uh, it is approved. And so for, that is very important for all patients to get tested. Uh, for MSI status, and this is something that we can do with some of the, the testing that Dr. Yap mentioned, like some of the commercial panels at MD Anderson, we have uh, a, a specific um, a panel that we, we use uh, that has a 600 genes, but um, also just by immunohistochemistry uh, with the, for the MSI uh, status. And so when one thing that we have to keep in mind with immunotherapy is that we have, it can have side effects. Like the majority of patients, they are tolerating this well, and you hear about uh, uh, about ads on TV, and that we and uh, maybe you know patients uh, who, who uh, receive immunotherapy, and usually they are tolerating it well. However, it can cause side effects. And uh, the, the toxicities, they are very different from the classical chemotherapy. And uh, it, um, it can cause uh, 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 an effect in any organ. Like, uh, and so immune checkpoint inhibitors can, um, uh, can uh, engage the immune system to attack normal cells not just the cancer cell. And so sometimes I was, exp uh, I'm, I'm explaining to patients, imagine that this is, is like Hulk, <laughs> that uh, it, it gets uh, the immune system so um, uh, um, uh, engaged that it will attack normal cells, not just the, the cancer cells. Um, and, but why it's so important to talk about these side effects? One is that we are, you saw the list of, uh, of uh, different tumor types, and we are getting more of the approvals, different combinations, and can attack any normal, uh, uh, any organ, any system, and can possibly lead to death. And so early recognition is really the key, and uh, we'll education of our patients, making sure that we are team with you, that we, uh, we communicate, that we are able to recognize these early on so we can treat them. And usually the treatment is stopping the, the immunotherapy, giving steroids or other means to, uh, uh, to temper the, the immune response and, uh, and to follow uh, our patients and work together with uh, some of the specialists for uh, that particular organ or uh, disease. For example, if we see um, related toxicity like in the liver, we will, uh, we will consult our hepatologist or dermatologist and so on. But, um, and um, how about patients who have autoimmune diseases? because these side effects really look like autoimmune diseases that when uh, in autoimmune diseases, our own body is producing antibodies against some of the normal cells. And most of these patients, they are excluded from immunotherapy trials. However, when uh, one problem that we face in the clinic every day is that what do we do? Do we... Uh, do we face uh, that or we don't treat uh, uh, a cancer or do we take uh, 
uh, and we take the, the rat of autoimmunity and we will face a possible flare up of some of the autoimmune diseases. For example, like a patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, giving immunotherapy might lead to a flare up of, uh, of uh, their symptoms. And so, uh, what, to answer some of these questions, like who are the patients who uh, who are able to tolerate immunotherapy even if they have an autoimmune disease? Uh, we are conducting a, a clinical trial, and um, this is a large clinical trial with with the NCI. And what uh, we did is so we created different cohorts for the specific autoimmune diseases, such as patients with rheumatoid arthritis, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, with patients with lupus, and so on. And what we realized that for immunotherapy, we really have to team up with the internal medicine, with the rheumatologist, with the, the gastroenterologist. And really, we move from having just one, one doctor per patient is really to having a team and really um, be able to create some guidelines and identify who are patients more likely to develop side effects and who are patients more likely uh, to respond also to immunotherapy. And so this is an ongoing effort that is, is going. Uh, right now, it's just with four patients uh, are receiving just uh, an ebolumab, which is an anti-PD-1 anti antibody. However, in the, the near future, we will be able to offer, hopefully, a combination treatment. And so talking about combination, so how do we overcome some of the resistance to, uh, to immunotherapy? And here you can see that there is not just the anti-PD-1 and PDL one uh, 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 antibody or a checkpoint in between the cancer cell and uh, and uh, the T cell, or uh, however, there are different interactions, and we have been trying to do different combinations of treatments of different immunotherapies, and this is one of them that was recently um, approved for patients uh, with melanoma, and this is coming after 10 years of really from the first uh, uh, anti-PD-1 and also anti-CTLA-4. This was actually the first one, but this is the most newer one that uh, it, uh, it really shows uh, an activity of, uh, of two immunotherapy combinations. And um, so the LAG-3, uh, which uh, is another immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, in immune checkpoint in addition to PD-1. And uh, it, um, the combination of relatlimab and uh, nivolumab uh, showed uh, activity in patients with uh, you know, uh, uh, advanced or metastatic melanoma. And uh, relatlimab, uh, what it does, it really blocks the protein on the immune cells that is called LAC3. While nivolumab, uh, I mentioned that is blocking PD-1, and by blocking these two proteins, both of them, they can uh, uh, increase the response against the tumor cells. And so, what is the difference? Is that uh, uh, the LAC3? Uh, it's uh, it, it is really um, designed to focus on on an immune uh, process that is called the priming. And it's the moment when the, the T cells are alerted that something's wrong and which uh, prompts uh, their response to the potential uh, 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 you know, uh, cancer cell. And um, for when we look at other combinations, here you can, um, and how can we, how can we enhance what we already see with just one uh, immunotherapy or an anti-PD-1 drug? And so there are now combinations with, uh, with chemotherapy, combinations with radiation. So imagine that if we do radiation and there are cancer cells that they are dying, they are releasing some, uh, some enzymes or antigens 
that they are able to get the, the immune cell to recognize better the tumor, to come and to infiltrate the tumor and be able to, uh, uh, to kill the, can the, the cancer cells. Another way is to try to do some intratumoral injections that will also get uh, the immune system to be able to recognize better the cancer cells. And, uh, and so on in terms of how do we get it better. And I just, uh, this was five years ago. You can see how many uh, different combinations. And unfortunately, so far the majority was, uh, were negative. And uh, we, uh, for, you hear a lot of conclusions saying, well, it is, uh, uh, it is safe, it it's, uh, shows some activity. However, it did not change our practice and uh, so far, the only immunotherapies that we have have the approved, they are, they are the anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1, anti-CTLA-4, which is the ipilimumab, and most recently, the relaclimab, uh, which is the anti-LAC-3. So it, you can still count them on one hand. Uh, however, um, I think that there is a tsunami of different combinations that uh, it's still coming and different ways to try to make the, the immunotherapy work uh, or to reverse its uh, resistance or exhaustion of, uh, of the immune responses. And so uh, how about new treatments? I just wanted to touch base about the new type of treatments that really uh, it, it's a new category of, of uh, drugs that they are called antibody drug conjugates. So in addition to having an antibody, it is carrying a chemotherapy that um, uh, it is attached by a linker. And this is a new class of drugs. It is not per se an immunotherapy. Uh, they are uh, in between, like uh, there are a new category in between the targeted therapies and um, uh, that uh, use a monoclonal antibody, uh, but um, it is uh, often very targeted towards a, a, a target such as HER2. And uh, it has a, a payload like a, a cytotoxic drug. And so I have just uh, one slide uh, explaining uh, uh, this and uh, imagine these as some Trojan horses that we are trying to use a specific marker on the cancer cell and use the antibody to get the chemotherapy directly inside the cancer cell. So exactly like a Trojan horse. And so antibody drug conjugate, you will hear more and more of this. So it has three parts, is the antibody that uh, targets the cancer cell. It has the cytotoxin or the payload and it is linked to the, to the antibody. And so one, and I will finish with this, it's just, is the trastuzumab, the Ruxtecan. Yeah, it's one um, good example of antibody drug conjugate. And um, as Dr. Yap showed some of the other waterfall plots, so each line is a patient. And you can see that they, basically there are no patients who had disease progression. So almost every patient had tumor decrease. This is in patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. But when we look at patients with HER2 low, it still works beautifully. So these are some of the new drugs that uh, we hear uh, more and more. And it's one way to uh, uh, what is new type of treatments beyond uh, immunotherapy in some tumor types, uh, such as endometrial cancer or other uh, tumor types that uh, we are trying to have a specific marker. And so first, so as take home messages is that uh, immunotherapy with immune checkpoints has really changed um, so the, the clinical outcomes in some, um, but unfortunately not all patients. There are combination therapies that they uh, target the immune uh, mechanism that um, 
we are hoping that we will be able to get better anti-tumor responses, but we are still lacking biomarkers. Uh, we only have the MSI high and the, the TMB high as biomarkers, but we do not have other ways to be able to really personalize uh, anti-cancer treatment. And uh, we other other ways to really to make uh, it more targeted. There are some uh, CAR T cells when different oncolytic viruses, but uh, uh, these are still in the de development and yet to show its efficacy in, in solid tumors. And really, I just want to, to say how important this collaboration between uh, oncologists and other specialists and with our patients to be a team to try to, uh, to find ways to, uh, to get better uh, responses, but also how to manage the toxicities from these treatments. And uh, um, of course, it takes a, a village uh, to do this. So I want to thank uh, you know, all um, our uh, collaborators and my team and uh, everyone that it helps uh, you know, get um, immunotherapy and other treatments to get work for, for, uh, for our patients. So I will stop and I uh, will hand it back over to Elise. Um, Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Dombrava. Um, and I'll ask Dr. Yap to come back on and join us. You can both turn on your mics and cameras um, so that we can get through our Q&A. We have a couple of questions that I do want to make sure that we have addressed because they were um, our top submitted questions, so submitted by multiple constituents. Um, so the first question that we're getting is, and this is relative, you can both answer to um, immunotherapy and to PARP inhibitors. There are a couple of constituents wondering if staging of cancer matters for when you can start a PARP inhibitor or when you can start immunotherapy, not just genetic mutation and tumor composition. And so Dr. Yap, I'll let you answer that first. With, uh, can you just, you just broke up a little, do you mind repeating that question again? Sure, so this constituent wants to know if the stage of cancer matters um, when starting a PARP inhibitor, or if it is more relative to genetic mutations, and then for immunotherapy, if it's more relative to tumor composition. Yeah, stage definitely matters. You know, obviously, uh, I, I think the examples that we gave earlier uh, are all based on patients getting systemic therapy. Obviously, if one has a very early stage of disease, you know, surgery should always be uh, thought of to try and cut out the cancer, uh, but uh, increasingly now there are more and more uh, neoadjuvant trials, so giving systemic therapy before you get surgery or in the adjuvant settings, so getting it after surgery, um, and that choice really will depend on the cancer type, research that's been done in that particular cancer type, so on and so forth. Um, with regards to you know, PARP inhibitors, it does depend as well on uh, if the patient has a particular mutation. So, for example, we know that in germline uh, patients with uh, breast cancer who have BRCA mutations, uh, Olaparib, the PARP inhibitor, is approved in the adjuvant setting, right? So, uh, I would encourage uh, the constituent to actually have a discussion with uh, their oncologist to really find out uh, what stage, you know, and what cancers are actually approved or where there are clinical trials ongoing uh, with particular drugs, so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. And same question for you, Dr. Dombrava, relative to um, immunotherapy. Sure, and, and so one good example is actually melanoma, where uh, in, in which case uh, immunotherapy is uh, approved as an adjuvant. So uh, really after having uh, tumor resection, patients being able to receive uh, immunotherapy. Uh, but um, it really depends on, on the tumor type. Um, there are some uh, clinical trials that they are ongoing and, and uh, asking this question. Um, is uh, immunotherapy in the neoadjuvant, so before surgery or after surgery uh, possible, or does it have 
uh, a pos positive impact in in terms of survival and how about toxicities in in these cases like um, does does it uh, it worth it um, I think in the, the next couple of years we will be able to have more more answers about that but it's really uh, for each case by case really reviewing uh, we always want of course we want cure right we want to be able to if um, there is uh, the possibility of having uh, a local treatment uh, uh, and uh, and trying to uh, to to maintain uh, um, that uh, for for a long time for patients to avoid recurring their um, to avoid a recurrence of their cancer so um, so the answer is in some tumor types yes but in others it's still uh, the question is still uh, on ongoing and hopefully we will have an answer thank you very much um this next question is for you dr yap um we have a constituent that was on a parp inhibitor went off and now they're experiencing recurrence they're wondering if they can restart with the same parp inhibitor after treatment or if they should look to have a conversation about other options with their oncologist yeah thanks for that i i think that's a good question uh, i would certainly have a further discussion i you know it really does depend on um, outcomes from the prior PARP inhibitor, what setting it was actually given in, uh, cancer type, you know, type of alteration, so on and so forth. And so it is, it is rather complex, and and of course, it depends on what other options there are as well, right? What what are the, what are the alternatives uh, to think about as well? So, um, you know, I, I would certainly encourage a discussion, a full discussion with the oncologist with regards to all of the above. Okay, excellent. And then this question is for you, Dr. Dumbrava. We have a constituent that underwent immunotherapy, um, stopped immunotherapy because of side effects, um, has since had a recurrence and is interested in revisiting immunotherapy, but is scared to experience those side effects again. Um, what can you say for this constituent in terms of kind of directing the conversation to her oncologist about next steps? No, that's that's an excellent point, and that's why I was emphasizing the importance of really managing some of the immune-related toxicities. Um, often depends on what was the side effect and uh, how severe it was. Uh, often depends on that if we can uh, re-challenge or not with uh, with immunotherapy. Um, or also, it, it depends. Like for example, we see a lot of uh, uh, thyroid uh, um, thyroid uh, related issues or thyroidism related to the immunotherapy. Often, we we are uh, even if that occurred, uh, we are we will still we challenge patients. Uh, another example is patients who develop type 1 diabetes. Um, uh, often our practice is that um, these patients will remain on insulin, but they had a destruction of the cells that they are producing the insulin. Uh, and so we still re-challenge them with the immunotherapy. However, with, in other cases, like for, for example, patients, they had uh, uh, in what we call pneumonitis or inflammation in the lungs that they require steroids uh, and maybe they require uh, uh, supplemental oxygen. Often in those cases, we we do not re-challenge with, uh, uh, with immunotherapy. And we are looking for other ways, uh, other new types of treatments that they are not uh, immune-based. Uh, but um, these are some questions, how to identify patients who are more likely to develop these immune-related toxicities. And also, how do we identify patients who will have other, or they will have higher risk of uh, developing other immune-related toxicities if we re-challenge them. Um, but we see that more like approximately like 60% of patients who had a grade three or severe 
uh, immune related toxicity if we challenge them they will have again um, either the same or in another organ um, an, an immune related toxicity so i would be very cautious and uh, again discuss uh, um, more details with uh, their oncologist and and really having a shared decision right uh, in in terms of uh, making a decision about re-challenging or not thank you very thorough answer um, and we do have time for one more question i'm going to ask this of each of you um, can you please point constituents to the best place to enroll for clinical trials that are being hosted at MD Anderson or elsewhere. So where can our constituents access um, enrollment? Kathy, do you want to go first? Um, sure. And so uh, I, I think um, it is uh, it is important. You know, clinicaltrials.gov remains one of the the main uh, main uh, resources of of finding clinical trials. Now there are, if uh, you go on just on Google, you see that there are many other tools that patients can help, and it's very hard for them uh, to to sift through everything that it's now. It's so much information available online. How do they uh, they make the difference about what is real or not, and how to uh, how to uh, I interpret some of the results and how to uh, reach out to uh, to different sites. Is that clinical trial available or not? And so uh, we are um, like I can give you the example of MD Anderson. Like what we are trying to do is that uh, uh, patients reach out to us, uh, which clinical trials are possible when once we see them in in our clinic, and often we present their case in our tumor board or treatment planning meeting, where we have all our study coordinators, we are 10 faculty, and we review first uh, our uh, precision oncology scientists, review their molecular profiles. So we look what mutations we can have a match treatment option, and uh, we review uh, after that, which clinical trials we have available, and we try to uh, to try to get the uh, Amazon choice, <laughs> or how uh, one of our uh, colleagues call it, calls it. Like, we, what are the top three? What do we know based on the evidence that we have that are more likely uh, able to work? Um, or the best uh, chances to work for, for that patient. And so that's how we are trying to make some decisions. But for patients that are not able to come to MD Anderson, uh, how to, uh, uh, to be able to access clinical trials, I would encourage them to, to reach out to, uh, to the contacts uh, on clinicaltrials.gov um, or then discuss with their treating physicians and really uh, be a team in, in choosing some of the trials. Yeah, I, well, I, actually, I, I would recommend that the, the patient speaks to their treating oncologist and go through their treating oncologist with regards to uh, clinical trials, whether it's at MD Anderson or whether it's um, at their local hospital, because um, I think there are many permutations, <clears throat> and so I would strongly encourage you know any patient to speak to their treating physician first, uh, and to get their treating physician to then reach out to clinical trial centers uh, and other uh, cancer centers. So, no, I, I agree with that. That first is the discussion with their own treating physician. It's the most important. Yes, they, yes, agreed. Um, Forrest does also have a tool on our website. It's called Search and Enroll, where you can search all active clinical trials um, and cover more information that way, but absolutely the conversation with your oncologist as well. So at this point, we're going to wrap up the webinar this weekend. I want to 
thank our panelists for your incredibly thorough and informative presentations. Um, our constituents are very grateful for the time and expertise that you've funded to us tonight. So at this time, I would just like to thank our sponsors one last time for bringing this programming to you. Please continue to reach out to FORCE for your support and information needs. While there are many mutations and many cancers, there is just one community, the FORCE community, that supports anyone who is impacted by them. So thank you for attending tonight, and good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye.